The US line on Israel has always been inconsistent. On the one hand, they say they want a diplomatic solution between Israel and its rivals. On the other, they arm Israel to the teeth and give it unconditional diplomatic backing, which means Israel has no interest in any peace deal. But the fact that Washington's stories don't add up has rarely been made as clear as in these answers by State Department spokesperson Matt Miller responding to Zateo's Prem Fakha. Prem, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Um, what we're seeing in Lebanon, we saw a similar pattern with with regards to Rafa. First, the U.S. saying, U.S. excuse me, saying that they wouldn't want to see Israel conducting major operations. Then Israel going ahead with what they called limited operations, and then this continued tolerance of sort of day to day attacks. That has led to over 44% of all buildings in Rafa being either destroyed or damaged, according to satellite photos. Which is to say that there might not have been a major operation in Rafa, but there was cumulative attacks that led to a good deal of destruction. So how does this precedent of Rafa portend for Lebanon? So every conflict is different, but if you look at what um, we continue to engage with Israel about when it comes to Lebanon, it is ensuring that they have the uh, ability to attack terrorist targets, terrorist infrastructure, a terrorist organization. But ultimately, we want to see a diplomatic resolution. Well, was that the case with Rafa? For instance, not just in Rafa, but... We've never never wanted... Hold on. We've never wanted to see a diplomatic resolution with Hamas. Well, okay. Well, well, what about the ceasefire? We wanted to see a ceasefire, but we have always been committed. We have we have always been committed to um, the destruction of Hamas. We did want to see a ceasefire, but we have always made clear that we wanted to see a different authority moving forward in governance of of uh, Gaza. That is so stupid. Like, that doesn't make any. They they want a ceasefire. They want a diplomatic resolution, but they don't want a diplomatic resolution with one of the sides who are fighting. You you can't make a ceasefire if you have a diplomatic resolution with someone else. Right? You can't say, oh, we'll negotiate a ceasefire between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Well, what's that going to do? It's not the Israel and the Palestinian Authority that are, that are fighting. The idea that you're calling for a ceasefire in the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Now, obviously, Israel's war is affecting many more people than Hamas, right? It is a war against the Palestinian people. But when you're talking about a ceasefire, you're talking about the two, the two sides who are fighting. The two sides who are fighting is Hamas and the IDF, the Israeli military. And he's saying, we want a dip, we, we want a ceasefire, but we won't negotiate with Hamas. We just want to destroy Hamas. Well then, buddy, you, you don't want a ceasefire, right? That's completely inconsistent. And it gets worse. Let's look at some more of that exchange. Okay, but so for instance, other UN satellite image shows that 66% of Gaza structures have been damaged. And you earlier today said that the U.S. supports the targeting of terrorist infrastructure, not civilian infrastructure. Does the U.S. believe 66% of Gaza's buildings are terrorist infrastructure? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Which is why we have been engaged to try to reach a ceasefire to end that conflict, which is why we have been pushing for a ceasefire to months. And I wish that Hamas would come to the table and work with us on a ceasefire. As you saw, as you heard me saying earlier, Hamas has been absent for weeks, won't even respond to the mediators putting forward ideas asking whether they would agree to a ceasefire or not. Look, you can talk about Israel and the culpability that has uh, that Israel has and the tough decisions that Israel needs to make. And it's absolutely true that Israel needs to make tough decisions to get to a ceasefire. But the way out of this conflict is a ceasefire. And it is Hamas that is missing in action right now that won't come to the table to talk about one. We don't want a diplomatic resolution with Hamas. We want to destroy Hamas. That's what he said in the first part of that clip we showed you. In the second part of the clip, and they were, you know, they were contiguous. There was no, they were, they were within the same two minutes. He says, Hamas are outrageous. Hamas are not letting us come to a diplomatic resolution because they won't come to the table. Well, maybe that's because uh, 30 seconds ago, you said you don't want a diplomatic resolution with Hamas. You just want to destroy Hamas. So how dare you not turn up to the negotiations? Oh, we didn't want to negotiate with them. We just wanted to destroy them. It is, it, it's completely nonsensical. And right, we, we've talked over and over and over again on this show about how the United States policy doesn't make sense. It's duplicitous. I mean, it you know, makes sense from if, if you want a greater Israel, for example, uh, or if you're trying to appease an Israel lobby, but it, it doesn't make sense sort of it's not coherent, let's say, because America say we want peace, we don't want escalation, but they continue to sort of 
arm Israel to the teeth and give it absolute diplomatic cover. So they say, oh, we're asking, we're asking him nicely to, to stop killing so many civilians. We're asking him nicely um, not to start a broader war with Lebanon, but at the same time, we'll veto any resolution um, at the UN Security Council, which might apply some real pressure to, to Israel. So it was always completely inconsistent. But I have never heard it being articulated in such a way where within two minutes, it's actually complete nonsense right you could know nothing about the war and hear those two minutes and think this guy is not making any sense whatsoever um eleanor i mean people talk about joe biden's cognitive decline uh matt miller <laughs> seems you know he's young and sprightly but is there a sense in which the, the whole administration is just incapable of making sense anymore Right. Maybe we should be talking about cognitive dissonance rather than cognitive decline, uh, because, of course, Israel has this year assassinated one of the chief peace negotiators, right? Ismail Haniyeh, um, a few months ago, was taken out by Mossad, which was supposed to be one of the chief organizations over the other side of the peace negotiating table. Like It's fundamentally ludicrous. And as you were saying, saying I don't want to ceasefire with Hamas involved. It's just another way of saying, I don't want to ceasefire, right? It's a way of justifying delays and detours and pretending it's a principled uh, stance because, you know, despite whatever criticisms you may rightly have about Hamas as an organization, Hamas is who you have to negotiate with, right? Uh, if the UK was under siege via by France, for instance, and one was saying, of course I want a uh, peace, of course I want a ceasefire deal, negotiating with Labour. Okay, who do you want to negotiate with then? These aren't serious propositions, they aren't serious people, and it's really sickening how fundamentally these, uh, it's really sickening how fundamentally unserious these approaches are, given that Gaza is running out of soil to bury its dead, right? That's the situation. So when Matt Miller is doing this sort of strange double talk. He's sort of doing uh, like PR cartwheels to try and squeeze all of these uh, necessarily contradictory messages into one nice, neat soundbite. This is the situation it's actually uh, allowing, right? Um, this is a way of, in which the US continues to soft pedal its own complicity, right? This very much reminds me of uh, the Israeli historian uh, Ilan Pape's uh, approach to the two solution, right? Or rather the approach to how the two-state solution is talked about, right? It's just something that now politicians are allowed to trot out and say, despite the fact that they may be doing absolutely nothing to push it forward and absolutely everything to stymie it wherever it might have the possibility of actually coming into existence, right? Um, it's just this sort of corpse that gets dressed up and paraded out. And then once it's served its function, it gets sort of you know, neatly shoved away again, right? Ceasefire um, talk from an administration that has been Israel's not only biggest supporter, but treating Israel as essentially uh, its own kind of military base, its own military flank for its own geostrategic interests in the region. Why should we believe um, anything that this administration has to say. And I think people are very rightly thinking about that when they're turning to the polls uh, in November, right? Many people across the US are looking at the offerings given from Matt Miller and saying, is this it? Is this the kind of liberal alternative to a Trumpian dystopia, yet more funding of the same kind of genocidal policies? Like, is there not an alternative? And so... Matt Miller has an unenviable job, right, which is to sell to the general public Israel's complicity, sorry, um, US complicity in Israel's genocide, right? Pretty hard to do, thankfully, very hard to do. Um, but it's just so representative of the kind of um, pressure that the Biden administration is under, because in order to pull off an election victory, it's going to have something serious to say to the many millions of Americans who are looking at what their government is doing, who are looking at where their tax dollars are going and thinking, not in my name. You could kind of see, because obviously Matt Miller is going to be an intelligent guy, right? You don't get that job if you're like stupid. So you could kind of see the, the, the cogs turning in his head where he's realizing, shit, what I just said is not 
consistent at all with what I'm saying now. Uh, I hope no one notices. You're also in a room with quite a lot of intelligent journalists. It's all like, uh, hopefully we're going to move on to a different questioner in a moment because I know what I'm saying doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And um, We've got some footage to show. This is video verified by Evan Hill of the Washington Post, a very good follow actually on Twitter. Um, it's showing Israeli forces... Um, evacuating casualties by helicopter across the border from the Lebanese um, village of Adassa, um, where Hezbollah claims to have staged an ambush today. And this will be really, really interesting, sort of as a running story. When Israel have gone into Lebanon before, previously, um, it hasn't tended to have gone particularly well. So in 1982, in 2006, both times Hezbollah sort of mounted a fairly effective resistance. Israel um, suffered many casualties and didn't achieve very much. Um, there have been hopes in Israel um, that they have severely um, deteriorated the capacity of Hezbollah by taking out its leader and a bunch of other um, senior commanders over the past couple of weeks. Of course, also that pager attack would have taken out, you know, would have injured, and presumably that's a lot of people out of action, um, thousands of, I think it was 1,500, 3,000, I can't remember the exact number, but many, many people injured by those pages, potentially somewhat senior. So th there had been a bit of speculation that maybe Hezbollah was so weakened at this point in time that Israel would be able to you know, fight a much more effective war in Lebanon than they had done previously. Um, so this is something we, I suppose, are, are about to discover. Obviously, there's not much we can sort of really interpret from that footage there or the fact that eight Israeli soldiers have been killed by now. That doesn't really tell us much about Hezbollah's fighting force, but I think that will be a big story um, over the next few days, weeks, potentially even months.